Third Nephi chapter 17 continues the ministry of the resurrected Lord to the Nephites. Filled with compassion, he extends his stay, healing the wounded and brokenhearted. He goes on to instruct them regarding the sacrament and baptism. He prays for the people in a way so great and marvelous that it cannot be written or even uttered by man. Through pure love and example, Jesus Christ has set the tone for the sacredness of the sacramental covenant and established a model of pure, authentic ministering. I invite you to join us in our study of 3 Nephi chapters 17 through 19 of the Book of Mormon and encourage each of us to seek divine inspiration. Welcome to Come Follow Up. Christ-like ministry to me means uh, love. Uh, when they asked Jesus what was the most two important commandments, it was love your God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. For me, Christ-like ministering is it's just genuine and sincere. You know, like the bracelet says, what would Jesus do? The time when someone did, did something Christ-like for me was when I was hurting on the ground and they helped me get up and like get better. My husband passed away 10 months ago tomorrow and the love that I've received from people truly came from God. And you can feel the prayers when people give them and know that they can only come from the other side of the veil. Welcome everybody to our discussion on 3rd Nephi chapters 17 through 19 of the Book of Mormon. My name is Ben Lomu and I'm your host. Our gospel scholar for today is Janet Erickson. Janet is an associate professor in the Department of Church History and Doctrine in BYU's Religious Education Program. She received her PhD in Family Social Science from the University of Minnesota and is a columnist for Deseret News. She lives in American Fork, Utah with her husband and their two children. Welcome, Janet. So good to be here. Thank you, Ben. And seated next to Janet is our special guest, Sheila Bridges. Sheila resides in the state of Missouri with her husband, Thomas. They share 15 children, 36 grandchildren, and six great-grandchildren. Sheila has actively been involved with strengthening families through foster and adoption parenting and various programs in the United States, South Africa, and India. Welcome, Sheila. Thank you. It's nice to be here. We're also joined by our studio audience. Thank you all for being here today. Our discussions today are built around the scriptures and complemented by the resource, Come Follow Me. Additional study and teaching material is available at byutv.org slash come follow up. All right, Janet, we have some beautiful chapters we're gonna be looking at today. Would you mind giving us an overview and some context on these chapters? I'd love to, Ben. So we know at the time of the crucifixion of Jesus, there was great destruction in the Americas and then he was resurrected, and he came to the Americas, and he appears to them, and then he teaches them, and he teaches them of baptism and, and of his Sermon on the Mount, and then he says, I'm going to leave. So we will be talking about this time when he extends that day, blesses, heals, and teaches, returns to heaven, then comes back and continues teaching. The first topic we're gonna to be looking at is the Savior is my perfect example of ministering, where do we see that within this block of scripture? Oh, Ben, we have to go to the verses. They're so beautiful. Okay. <laughs> Chapter 17 of 3 Nephi, verses two and three. He looks at them after he's taught them so much, and he says, I perceive that you are weak, that you cannot understand all my words, which I am commanded of the Father to speak unto you at this time. Go ye into your homes and ponder upon the things which I have said, and ask of the Father that ye may understand and prepare your minds for tomorrow. Because he says, I'm going, and then I'll come back. And then happens these most beautiful verses. Verse five, and it came to pass that when Jesus had thus spoken, he cast his eyes round about and again on the multitude, and behold, they were in tears, and did look steadfastly upon him as if they would ask him to tarry a little longer with them. As he looks at them, he says, I'm filled with compassion, and he stays, and we get to study how he ministers to them in that period as he's looked at them and sensed their yearning for him to be with them. So Sheila, as we jump into this first topic of, of ministering, how the Savior is the perfect example of this, how has ministering been a blessing to you in your life? It's been a blessing to my life in many ways. 
one particular way is becoming a foster parent to many, many children. I heard the need, the cry for foster parents, and I thought, perhaps I need to check into this because my heart is feeling very strongly about this. And I went through training, and I became a foster parent. And it was just the beginning of opening a whole new world to me of how other people live and their experiences and how the Savior himself would love these little ones. You know, we can see elements of how the Savior felt towards those uh, to whom he was teaching in what Sheila was telling us, how there is a need that needed to be filled. And he felt that, he sensed that. And through this process and these chapters, we get to see some powerful principles of ministering. Uh, can we take a look at some of those things and what we can learn how, and how we can better minister in our own lives? I love hearing about Sheila's life. It's miraculous, but, but so beautiful to think of seeing a need, mm -hmm. as you referenced, Ben, and what that ministering means is to see a need and respond. Mm -hmm. And every person is going to come with different needs. That's why it's so beautiful that he begins by looking into their faces and seeing that they didn't want him to leave. And then he says, that second principle maybe is, behold, in verse six, my bowels are filled with compassion towards you. To think the very core of him, the very center of him was filled with a yearning to be with you in your feeling and respond to that. So certainly that has to be one of those beautiful principles of ministry mm -hmm. is to see need. We can't always fix it. I love hearing you talk about the various traumas and challenges that those children came with that you couldn't just fix, That's right? but you could be with them mm -hmm. in that journey of healing and in the process offer what was needed. Sheila, how have you been able to discern the needs of others so that you can take that first step? Just doing what I believe the Savior would do when He ministered, feeling and seeing in person and holding a child in need, opened my heart to something new and started a journey that I had never thought of before. It's something that helped me to feel closer to the Savior Himself and how He loves each one of us as I loved these children. And they came at various times and they came with various circumstances. Mm -hmm. You need to be with them in order to feel by the Holy Ghost what their needs will be. Mm -hmm. I love how Sheila said that it, it just came at various times. Mm. Ministering isn't always convenient. And how do we change our hearts to be ready to feel that need and to minister appropriately? Mm. Ben, I love, I love that Sheila referenced seeing them in person mm -hmm. at a time when we have less in-person kinds of interactions yeah. so often the importance of physically feeling, of looking at, of touching, of being in homes, of seeing people in their presence. And it feels like when you do, you can't turn away, as inconvenient as it is. I'm sure the Savior must have been exhausted. And as much as they needed rest, right? He probably needed rest, but right. he looks into their faces, senses their need, and can't not respond. Sheila, is there one specific moment where it wasn't exactly the most convenient time to minister, but you did it anyways, and what was the result of that? There was a child, a baby, at one time. I received a telephone call to come to the hospital and pick up that child, and it was not a convenient time. I had a lot of children. My husband had been out of the country, and I just felt a little bit overwhelmed. However, I did visit with my husband about it over the phone, and he said, as good as God has been to let us find one another, the least we can do is take this child when he's asked us to. So he came back, we went to the hospital, we took the baby home, and the eventual outcome of this was that baby's presence changed a law in an entire nation where people who were not citizens, could come, and it was possible for that child to go home to America with us, and that had never happened before. Wow. Answering that call that was inconvenient yes. opened the way. Mm -hmm. 
And you had read a verse earlier about how the Savior felt towards those uh, he was teaching and verse six. Can we talk a little bit about the compassion mm -hmm. that the Savior has for us? Seems like it is the defining word of Jesus Christ. And so when he says there, my bowels are filled with compassion, it seems that's the governing reason he came to earth was to say, I've got to, as we learn in Alma 7, feel what they feel so that I can succor them in their need. And then to say his whole soul is filled with it, that yearning to be with us in our suffering. Mm -hmm. Sheila, can you talk to us a little bit about the process of learning to love all those around you? And not be overwhelmed by it, Sheila. Right. That's right. right. It is through the Savior's love and his example, just as you're speaking about. It is through his love and understanding him and knowing that he's with you and he is presenting perhaps these situations for us to learn and then to go about loving as he would love and not thinking about yourself and, and how inconvenient it might be or if you're going to get to keep the child or you're going to have to love the child and watch it leave. You just love them for whatever time the Lord has blessed you with that little child, that little one, and you help them however you can. And I was able to hold them and tell them if but for a day or two, you're a child of God and their eyes would get big. I'm a child of God. Mm. They did not understand that they were someone special and they had great worth and they were loved deeply. This reminds me of a quote so beautiful by Sister Bonnie Corden. Mm talking about loving those to whom you minister. She said, as you pray, you will feel the love of Jesus Christ for those to whom you minister. Share that love with them. What better way is there to feed his sheep than to help them feel his love through you? Mm -hmm. I would love to hear from the audience on how your life has been blessed by the ministering of others. David. Years back, our son had RSV uh, during the winter times. He was just a couple months old and it was a really scary time. Mm -hmm. And our congregation really banded around um, supporting us. People coming to the hospital just to hold our child for hours at a time to, to give us relief. And we just felt so support and loved. And in a way it was kind of like the, the savior reaching out to us and using all these different people to help minister to us. When we've had such certain situations with other people as well, we've had that added empathy um, and that perspective that the Savior would have and trying to be open and at, at times drop everything what you're doing and just being there as a congregation of family uh, to be able to support each other. That's great. Thank you for sharing that, David. So there's one aspect of here I'd like to, to look at. As Jesus is teaching, he specifically mentions that there are men, women, children, kind of painting this picture of families listening together. Janet, do you mind talking to us a little bit about that? I love that. I think this whole section is about families. And so as you highlighted, verse 25 of 35, 17, he says they were in number, 2,500 souls, and they did consist of men, women, and children. Earlier, he will tell the parents, bring your children and set them round about me. And then in chapter 19, it says, every man did take his wife and his children and re did return to his own home. And then he teaches them about praying mm -hmm. in their families. So this is all about families. So we'll just look here in verse 11. After they had bowed down in front of him, after he had healed all of them, he says, and it came to pass that he commanded that their little children should be brought. And then it says after that, and I just had not paid attention to this. The Savior says to them, kneel. He commands the parents to kneel. I don't know if the children knelt as well, but they all kneel. And then it says, this is verse 15, and behold, he prayed unto the Father, and the things which he prayed cannot be written. The eye hath never seen, neither hath the ear heard, so great and marvelous things as we saw and heard Jesus speak unto the Father. And I was touched thinking, here are these parents hearing him pray for them. We weak parents that are trying to right? Minister to the needs of children and failing at it and struggling, struggling to love as he would love, struggling to minister as he would minister. And I can't imagine what it must have felt like to have him pray for me as a mother. And he says, verse 20, and now behold, my joy is full. And then he takes the children after he's prayed for the multitude. 
with words that couldn't be written, and he blesses their little children. Sheila, what significance do you see the fact that the Savior ministered to families, how we're encouraged to minister among our own families, and how he ministered to the children? Well, I think he's still doing it today. I know he is. Mm. We had one daughter who was developmentally delayed, and she did not have any verbal skills or any, they said she didn't have any cognitive or verbal skills. And she didn't take her first step until she was four. But we celebrated that. One night, I had a house full of children. And one night in the middle of the night, a child started singing, I am a child of God. I woke up and I thought, who in the world is singing at this hour? (laughs) And so I got up and started checking the bedrooms and checking the children. They were all tucked in and asleep, except for that one little child Mm. that had never been verbal. Mm. She was singing, I am a child of God. And I thought, oh my goodness. Mm. I went in there and sat on the side of her bed and I said, honey, how are you? And she said, I be with Jesus. Mm. These are her words, her first words I'm hearing. And I said, what do you mean? I'm going to test her. (laughs) What do you mean? What are you talking about? And she said, he took me to his house to play. Mm. And I thought, no, that didn't happen. Where did she get this from? And I said, well, tell me, what is his house like? And she said, it's like Christmas with lights everywhere. Mm. And he promised he would come back and get me someday. Wow. And I thought, oh my goodness. I gave her a hug and tucked her back in bed. So beautiful, Sheila. Miracles. Just miracles from Jesus. He Mm -hmm. is still, Heavenly Father is still very mindful of each one of His children, each one. And Sheila, what's so beautiful is I think the most important thing He teaches us here is just make room for them to come to me. I will do the healing. And that's what she was experiencing. It's so beautiful to think of what the Savior says. Verse 21, And when he had said these words, he wept, and the multitude bare record of it, and he took their little children one by one, that other principle of ministering, and blessed them and prayed unto the Father for them. And when he had done this, he wept again. He spake unto the multitude and said unto them, Behold your little ones. And I don't think he's saying, Look at how cute they are. No, right? no, no, no. He's saying, you are going to see them in a totally new way. You're going to see them the way I see them. The way I see them. Yeah. Well, this has been such a great conversation on how the Savior is our perfect example of ministering. Thank you both so much for sharing your thoughts and insights. And thanks for the audience for sharing with us as well. And for those at home, how do you seek opportunities to minister? Share with us on any of our social media platforms. I try to make the sacrament a more spiritual experience every week by making sure that I'm focusing on Christ and reflecting on my week on what I have, mistakes I have made and repented for, and maybe what I can do better for the next week. I love music. When they're passing the sacrament, I'll have my hymn book out and I'll just read over the words from the sacrament, either from that day or or I have a favorite song, uh, a couple different sacrament hymns. So I'll, I'll go over those words as the sacrament's being passed around. For me, when I take the sacrament, I envision Christ and the sacrifice and the things that I have done that He atoned for for me. So instead of it being just some generic taking of the bread and water, what what stripes did He receive because of me? What per, you know? What personally did He do for me on my behalf? The second topic we're going to be looking at is I can be filled with the Spirit as I take the sacrament. Janet, where do we see that in these chapters? In some ways, not unlike when he did the Last Supper, probably not too long before this event, Mm -hmm. then he's going to be preparing them and teaching them the meaning of the sacrament, how they can have his presence more fully, and that we'll renew that covenant along with all the other covenants we have made in our meetings at church on Sunday. And so he's going to be teaching them about this. And then they will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, which is the promise of the sacrament that he might always be with us through his Mm -hmm. spirit. You know, I love just how family focused Mm -hmm. the gospel of Jesus Christ really is. And we, we see that as he's administering the sacrament, 
among families. Yeah. Can you talk to us a little bit about that, Janet? It's been so beautiful. I love how they are gathered there as families to hear his teachings about the sacrament. If we just look at verse 21, he says, Pray in your families unto the Father, always in my name, that your wives and your children may be blessed. It seems as he's performed this sacred blessing of the children in the previous chapter, where the glory of God is manifest in angels coming down and ministering unto them. We hear that language in the presence of God and angels and witnesses. And he's doing something very sacred in this ordinance of the sacrament that is not like, unlike what happens in temple ordinances, binding us together. And that this sacrament ordinance that is broken and brought back together, in a sense, is this symbol of the at-one-ment that we are mm -hmm. to experience with Christ individually in our families and with one another as the entire family of God. It's amazing to read these verses in 3 Nephi 18 and to see the sacrament prayers that are given every Sunday, only this time it's His words, that you're willing to do that which I have commanded you in remembrance of my blood, that you might always have my spirit to be with you. He's using my. Of course, we change those words to third person, that we might always have His Spirit to be with us, but that we witness that we will remember, that we take upon us His name. All of those words are right here in His prayers that He first gives us. And that the sacrament is symbolically that closeness to Him, mm -hmm. so close that it's like bread being taken in and metabolized and water that we need to sustain life being taken in. And that in that closeness to Him, a willingness to keep His commandments, take His name upon us, remember Him, then we are built upon that rock of Christ, almost seamlessly bound to Him. I want to focus on this word of remember. Sheila, how does partaking in the sacrament help you remember Christ? It's definitely a connection to Him spiritually, a closeness to Him as I partake of the sacrament that gives me a new week renewing my covenant with Him, knowing that He lives, He lives, and that He wants the best for all of us. And so if we will remember Him, we will be close to Him. We will become one with Him. And that enables us, as we're one with Him, to do those things, serving, ministering, loving one another, that helps us to do that. Mm -hmm. The word remember, Ben, I'm so glad you said it because it's like remember means to put back together, to remember. And we are broken by life. We experience brokenness in mortality. And then in that sacrament, He remembers us. Only like the beautiful kintsugi where they take yeah. that pottery and it's broken, but when they put it back together, they seam it with gold. Mm -hmm. I'll think when we partake of the sacrament, it's like He's putting us back together with His blood and body, like gold that binds us anew. Absolutely. And we are remembered as a person, as a family, as an eternal family mm -hmm. because of His brokenness. I, I would love to hear from the audience on what are some things you do in your life to remember Jesus Christ? Marian. I try to communicate with him all the time so that he's always a part of my life. Whenever something happens to me, good or bad, or I need help, I'm always, Heavenly Father, please help me. Heavenly Father, this is going on. And I have a conversation with him multiple times in the day. So I know he's there for me and he knows I'm there for him. Marion, what is the role of the Holy Ghost in helping you always be conscious and aware of Jesus Christ in your life? Oh, it's huge. That's how I feel Him, is through the Holy Ghost. So when I'm going to Him and pleading to Him for a certain thing, I need to feel His Spirit. I need that answer. So I get that answer through the Holy Ghost. And so I need to make my life accessible to the Holy Ghost. That's so beautiful. I love how she said she needs to make her life accessible mm. so that she can be touched and feel the mm. Spirit. And that's what the sacrament does. Mm -hmm. That's one of the promised blessings is that we can have that Spirit with us through the sacrament. Oh, I loved how Marion, it was like you were reading his words because he teaches them about the sacrament. And then he says, <laughs> verse 15, ye must watch and pray always. The very first thing he teaches them after the sacrament is to pray. And then the next day, they pray for what they desired most, which was to have the Holy Ghost with them. 
And I love at the end of verse 11, where he says, and if ye mm. do always remember me, ye shall have my spirit to be with you. Mm. That promise of stay the course, keep doing what you're supposed to do. Turn to me. Turn yeah. to me and I will bless you with my spirit. Mm. Sheila, how, how do you feel like your life has been guided by the spirit? I just know that he is there and that the spirit, the comforter is there. And if I leave myself open to him, mm -hmm. it comes. Sometimes I'm not even praying for something to come and it presents itself. When I became a foster parent, I knew I did not have the experience to handle some of the conditions that they came to my home in. So I knew that I needed God. And I started researching and, and visiting different churches to see if there was one that felt good to me. And they all had a little bit of a good feeling. Mm -hmm. But when I went into this tiny little branch of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints with the foster children, they scooped them up in their arms. <laughs> there was nothing different about them. They were father's little children. And I thought, oh, and I kept going to church and then the stake president came and spoke and I didn't know who he was, but I agreed with everything he said. Mm. And I went up afterwards and told him and he had a talk with the missionaries and they came to my home and the Holy Ghost did reveal the truth to me. And a week later I was baptized. That's so neat. I love hearing stories like that. Yes. And we had a question that came in from one of our viewers that I'd like to watch and then uh, discuss afterward. Hi, my name is Heinen Lewis. I was born and raised in Paris, France, and I currently live in Provo, Utah. In 3 Nephi, chapter 17, Jesus Christ is ministering to the Nephites and as usual is an example of perfection in words and actions. I find it hard to relate because he was perfect and I am imperfect. So my question is, how do I know what is actually possible in my ministering effort, since I will never achieve perfection like he did? How would you help uh, answer this question, Sheila? I can certainly connect with being imperfect. I think of the atonement mm -hmm. of the Savior Jesus Christ and the blessings that are attached to that of being able to repent mm. because we are imperfect and to partake of our sacrament and to connect with Him and then try again. Mm. Try to do better, try to be better, mm -hmm. try to be like Him. He doesn't give us just one opportunity to do that. Yes. It's multiple opportunities Absolutely. and we need those. I love this question thinking of your response here, Sheila, and thinking about how maybe if we know, the more we know our own brokenness mm -hmm. in the process of loving imperfectly, we can know our own belovedness. And that the process of receiving the Lord's love for us in our imperfection is maybe the key to being able to offer love to others. Absolutely. Unafraid of its brokenness, unafraid of its flawed nature, but trusting that He is he is the source of all of that love for me and for the person I'm trying to serve. I would love to hear from the audience. When in your life do you feel like you were being guided by the Spirit? Koki. One time I was, uh, I was heading to an important meeting for work and I'm about to hit the, the freeway exit. And I felt a prompting to go visit a kid at one of my schools that I work at. And I was like, this is my boss's boss. I'm going to miss this meeting for real. Mm. And then I decided, okay, I better, I better listen. And I, I got on the freeway. I, I showed up at this school. Sure enough, I walked there and into the principal's office. And this same kid I had the prompting about is sitting on the couch. And this kid in particular that day was having a really hard day. And I'm so glad I listened to that prompting. I was able to meet this kid. We were able to talk, get him some help and some resources. Koki, when you are feeling those promptings, for you, what is that experience like? You know, honestly, it started with like good thoughts. Okay. And I always thought, okay, is this my thought or is this God's thought? Mm -hmm. Is this a prompting or is it not? And um, I've come to know over the years, if it's a good thought, just go with it. And 
it's really helped to know that those good thoughts just come from our Father in heaven. That's a great experience and a perfect example of what following the Spirit looks like and what Heavenly Father is trying to do by sending us His Spirit. Thank you so much for sharing that. Mm -hmm. This has been so great talking to you about our second topic, that we can be filled with the Spirit as we partake of the sacrament. Thank you both so much for sharing your thoughts and experiences with us. And for the audience, you've been so great. Thanks for joining us today and sharing with us as well. And for you at home, we still have much to cover in footnotes. Stay with us. I have a journal edition of my scriptures that I like to study at night before I go to bed, and I write down personal promptings that I receive as I'm reading the scriptures and praying. I think coming to the scriptures with a question is really important, or something you want to focus on, like, I want to know more about Jesus Christ, or I want to see Christ in this particular thing that I'm studying. My family always worships in a funny way that I think is awesome. So after every prayer, we always say what we love about the person that said the prayer. Sometimes I like to read the books of uh, Proverbs and Psalms, you know, when I need peace. So uh, just depending on the situation, but I try to read it uh, at least every day. I will read at nighttime because that's best for me. But also I love listening to podcasts and church conferences so that that can help me to correlate the scriptures with the modern scriptures. Welcome to Come Follow Up Footnotes. We've dismissed our studio audience and are looking forward to building upon our previous discussions from 35 chapters 17 through 19 with Janet and Sheila. We'd also like to welcome a new guest, Joshua Sears. Josh has a PhD in Hebrew Bible from the University of Texas at Austin and teaches Bible and Book of Mormon classes at Brigham Young University. He and his wife, Alice, are raising their five kids in Linden, Utah. Josh, thanks for joining us. Excited to be here. Okay, so we're going to jump right back into these chapters, and I'd like to go back and start on in chapter 17. Janet, what are some other things that you can share with us that are important as we look at these chapters? These sections are some of everyone's favorites, right? Because they take us to seeing the, the risen Christ and having an experience with Him ourselves and seeing who He is. These scriptures are the longest sections that we have of the Savior's teachings as a resurrected being. And one of the things to note is his emotion that a resurrected being is not just a disconnected, dispassionate being who oversees things, but is intimately connected with us, with our feelings and with his own. And so we can see in chapter 17, for example, if you look at verse six, my bowels are filled with compassion. My bowels are filled with mercy. And then if we go over to 14, we see that he is groaning within himself, troubled, because of the wickedness. And we see in verse 18 that he experiences profound joy and expresses it in weeping. So I think we get to know this remarkable being and have a, have a witness of what God is like and what he intends for us to be like as resurrected beings. Mm -hmm. And what's amazing here is that he's reacting to what's going on with the people, mm -hmm. right? And having an emotional response suggests that he has continued to make himself vulnerable to what is going on in our lives, reacting to our good times and our bad times mm -hmm. and feeling that kind of empathy. So like you said, now even past his atoning sacrifice, past being resurrected, he's mm -hmm. not just up on some distant throne mm -hmm. uh, dispensing comfort to those that stand in need of comfort, but at greater kind of personal cost, he's mourning with those that mourn. Mm -hmm. He's still being empathetic and willing to be a part of our experience as we mm -hmm. make this journey. Sheila, what are your thoughts on Christ being loving and compassionate? How have you seen that in your experiences? He has always shown that in his experiences with us, especially his little ones. The way he sees them and feels of their pain, their joys, in times when it's very difficult, he offers encouragement. And there are miracles that come forth uh, when I don't expect them. That's beautiful. Thanks, Sheila. It's beautiful, Ben, because in, before he is crucified, right, he tells them over and over again, if you have seen me, mm -hmm. right? Thomas, you wonder who the Father is, but if you've seen me, you have seen the Father. But, but here he is resurrected, showing us what our Father is like, goodness, love, purity, emotion. And we see here in chapter 17 where Jesus tells them, I'm going to go visit my other sheep. He is mindful of all of his children all across the world. Can we speak a little bit about that, Janet? Mm. 
isn't that marvelous as members of the church when you can travel all over the world and you enter into a congregation? You may not understand the language, but you have this sense that we are all part of the same whole. Yes. I've been in locations uh, around the world where mm. in one church unit, a very small unit in India, we had representation of probably five languages. Wow. And they would be giving talks in their own language, and you would go by the Spirit to understand what each one was presenting from the Savior. Children of the same Father. Yes. Seeing, yes. hearing, understanding one another. Evidence of His love and goodness. So, of course, He's mindful of His children wherever they are. The Savior saying, I, I've got to go visit them too. None are forgotten. Mm -hmm. He is aware, watching over, loving. Yeah, that line in verse 4 is powerful. For they are not lost mm. unto the Father, that He's mindful mm. of them, whatever has happened to them. Mm. We sometimes struggle over family members who might have left the covenant path or others we know that are making poor life choices, and we wonder, can they make their way back? And this is a testimony that Heavenly Father knows exactly where they mm. are and that no one's lost to Him. I love, too, in these sections how we learn about the Holy Ghost. He taught them about baptism. At the beginning of his appearance, he had given power to baptize, and he'd referenced that they will need a baptism of the Spirit as well as baptism of water. But I don't think they quite understood yet how do we receive the Holy Ghost, and what does that process look like, and what will that power do for us? And so we're going to learn, I think, in these sections about the Holy Ghost. Yeah, in chapter 19, verse 9, this is now the second day of his ministry, and he hasn't come back quite yet. It says that they did pray for that which they most desired, and they desired that the Holy Ghost should be given unto them, because they want these promises mm -hmm. that he was hinting at and teaching about the previous day. And then, in verse 10, they go down to the water's edge, and then the, the disciples begin baptizing the multitude. They go down into the water, in verse 11, and are baptized. And then what we see in verse 13 is that the blessing that they were praying for is given to them. It came to pass that when they were all baptized and had come up out of the water, the Holy Ghost did fall upon them and they were filled with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And I find it striking that before going to get baptized, they were praying earnestly so that they could get the Holy Ghost. And I think one thing they might have recognized is that simply going down and going through the mechanics of the ordinance is not enough to get mm -hmm. the Holy Ghost. It is a gift from Heavenly Father. And this is something that Nephi had already taught centuries before back in 2 Nephi 31. So maybe they've got a little bit of this in mind. And he explains that the baptism of water is for a witness that we are willing to, um, in the chapter he talks about keeping the commandments, that we're willing to take upon ourselves the name of Christ. But Nephi has this caution in 2 Nephi 31 verse 13. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, I know that if ye shall follow the Son with full purpose of heart, acting no hypocrisy and no deception before God, but with real intent, repenting of your sins, witnessing unto the Father that you are willing to take upon you the name of Christ by baptism, yea, by following your Lord and your Savior down into the water according to his word, behold, then shall ye receive the Holy Ghost." And receiving the Holy Ghost in this baptism of fire is essential because as Nephi points out, that's what brings the remission of sins. In verse 13, he points out it brings spiritual gifts, like speaking with the tongues of angels. Being reborn. Exactly. Right, this process. Nephi is warning that going through the mechanics, simply getting in the water, getting wet, doing those things may not be enough. Mm -hmm. It's got to be with that full purpose of heart, truly repenting. Mm -hmm. So not just doing the actions on the outside, but going through that conversion on the inside. It really takes that earnest seeking in order to get the Holy Ghost. And I wonder if that's something that in 3 Nephi 19 that he's the disciples are aware of. They're about to go down in the water. They know we can do this part, but we really want the Father to then follow through with what He's in charge of, which mm -hmm. is sending us the Holy Ghost. And they got it, so they must have had the full purpose mm -hmm. of heart. And I know in my own life, this is something I have to remember because with a sacrament, for example, it can be so easy for me <laughs> after a hectic morning getting kids ready for church and dressed and everything <laughs> else going on. I've got to make sure it's not a mechanical process that I'm simply, oh, the bread's here, the water's here, yeah. and I do it. But if I'm not repenting and I'm not seeking and I'm not earnestly desiring the Holy Ghost the way these Nephites were, I feel like sometimes I lose out on the full spiritual feast mm -hmm. that I could be receiving. Mm, it's true. Sheila, what difference did you notice in your life after you joined the church mm -hmm. later on in your life? 
and could really feel that you had the gift of the Holy Ghost with you. The first time I felt the Holy Ghost was during my interview, baptism interview, <laughs> and I stopped talking completely. And the elder that was giving the interview, he said, it's okay, I feel it too. I said, no, you don't understand. <laughs> I think I'm gonna pass out. <laughs> and he smiled and he said, it's all right. It's the Holy Ghost. And I had never felt it like that before. It was completely through me, throughout me. And uh, it was as I was speaking about the truth of something that you I felt. You were testifying and then it yes. was witnessing to you of the truth. Yes. Wow. So beautiful. And there have been many times I wasn't sure of what the next step should be. And then the Holy Ghost would present itself to me. And He can help any of us with any situation and answer our prayers. Isn't that beautiful? Mm -hmm. oh. I love this um, description, and you experienced it, Sheila, of receiving, because isn't it interesting that when, they, when the Savior after he blesses the children, and then he sends his disciples to go get bread and wine. And then he says, you're watched over, you can sit and just receive. And it says, as they receive the sacrament, they are filled. And it's like he's teaching us, there is one who can satisfy the hunger of your soul. And it is me through the presence of the Holy Ghost. And sit and receive it. Be still and receive it. Come and just receive it. You know, what's interesting is I was studying these chapters. Uh, I'm all, I always get a little sad when he leaves, you know? Yes, like, we're just, sad uh, with them. I know, <laughs> it's so sad for them. And so, so he leaves and then I'm reading in chapter 19 yeah. and I'm looking at everything that his, uh, his disciples that he's called are doing. And I'm waiting, like, when's he coming back? Yes. When's he gonna come back? <laughs> and it, it kind of opened my eyes even further to the importance of having apostles Mm. prophets, seers, mm. revelators on the earth today to give us the direction and the guidance uh, that we need. Because knowing that he's not here, and, and especially at this time, knowing that I'm going to leave, but I'm not going to leave you alone. You're going to have the Holy Spirit with you, and I'm going to give you guidance through my disciples. Can we talk a little bit about the role of the disciples in these chapters? Mm. Yeah, you'll see frequently in these chapters that he'll address the multitude, mm -hmm and then he'll switch and address That's something right. to the 12, and then he'll address the multitude again, and then the 12. So you see the back and forth. There's one spot that I find extra interesting, <laughs> I guess, at the end of chapter 18. He's getting ready to depart at the end of day one and go away. And in the chapter 18, verse 36, it came to pass that when Jesus had made an end of these sayings, he touched with his hand the disciples whom he had chosen one by one, even until he had touched them all and spake unto them as he touched them. And the multitude heard not the words which he spake. Therefore, they did not bear record. But the disciples bear record that he gave them power to give the Holy Ghost. And so here's a part where usually he's just directing himself to one group or the other. But here, the multitude doesn't get to hear what he says. And later in the Book of Mormon, we find out more specifically what he told them. It's in Moroni chapter 2, where he says, The words of Christ, which he spake unto his disciples, the twelve, whom he had chosen, as he laid his hands upon them. How did I never make that connection? <laughs> and then in verse 2, it says, He called them by name, saying, and now we get the quote that we didn't quite get in the summary earlier, Ye shall call on the Father in my name in mighty prayer, and after ye have done this, ye shall have power that to him upon whom ye shall lay your hands, ye shall give the Holy Ghost. And in my name shall ye do it, for thus do mine apostles. Now Christ, this is Moroni again, now Christ spake these words unto them at the time of his first appearing, and the multitude heard it not, but the, but disciples, the disciples heard, heard it. it. Wow. And on as many as they laid their hands, fill the Holy Ghost. And I've asked myself, why didn't he just keep talking louder so that everybody could hear? And I don't know all the reasons. I'm sure there might be more than one. But one thing I've wondered about is if this was a little exercise in teaching the multitude. Mm -hmm. You know, there's going to be times when you hear things directly from me through the Spirit mm -hmm. or my own voice. But there's also going to be times when I'm going to speak to my authorized chosen servants, and I want you to trust them. Who will lead them to Christ, which mm -hmm. is so beautiful. And it records several points after this that as many, on many as they lay their hands came the Holy mm -hmm. Ghost. So they're telling the truth. They really did get the authority. But the multitude had to learn that there is in the kingdom, mm -hmm. there an are ordering. these servants. There's an order that he's chosen. And there's times where on faith you need to trust in the words of his authorized servants. 
And that continues today. Mm -hmm. Yes, it does. Wow. Okay, so what was that like for you when you first learned that we do have prophets who speak for God? How was that like for you to really trust in the words that they were saying? For me, I felt the Spirit when they spoke. So it was simple to trust. And then as I met some of them, that was really an experience um, because you could feel the Spirit. You could see it in their eyes, you could feel it in their hands and in their words as Mm -hmm. they spoke. I remember our young daughter who isn't always an immediate spiritual open person. That's a very private thing for her. But it was during general conference and she just said, what am I feeling? And I think for her, it was to hear the voice of the Lord to her. And it was for her, it was a feeling of love. That's what she experienced it as, it was love. So just thinking these, these called that we learn to trust as being channels of being power through which we can draw closer to the Lord and experience Him in our lives. And that's what they will do for us if mm-hmm. we will listen. And it really is a great experience that we can all have of gaining that witness of prophet seers, and revelators. Mm-hmm. What I think is so beautiful is that the most joyous part of General Conference is that temple being built in this place, in this place, in this place, that prophets of God have priesthood (laughs) keys of authority from God to perform ordinances in our behalf that establish a relationship with God, that we depend upon those unlocking that power in that relationship. So these sections are so beautiful because I think they keep pointing us to the temple. These 17 through 19, how the Lord seeks to be in relationship with us and that through ordinances and through covenants, that relationship becomes ever more at one with Him until we are fully at one with Him. And for me, next month, Mm. I will be able to perform those sacred ordinances in proxy for my mother Mm. and I will be sealed to my mother and father and seal them to their parents. We'll seal her to her parents. Wow. And I wow, am Sheila. so looking forward to that. I'm <laughs> yes. glad that I have lived to see this, this part. It's, it's magnificent to even think upon being sealed to my family forever. Mm-hmm. It seems like, Sheila, that's what's going on. Something like that power is being experienced in 3rd Nephi 17, in verse 23, where it says, And he spake unto the multitude after he blessed the children. And as they looked to behold, they cast their eyes towards heaven. And they saw the heavens open, and they saw angels descending out of heaven, as it were in the midst of fire. And they came down and encircled those little ones about, and were encircled about with fire. And the angels did minister unto them. And I can't help but think of that altar with children surrounding that altar. And that the generations before and after that God isn't just alone in the heavens, but angels. His throne is surrounded by angels, ancestors, people who care about us, care about our children, and that those ordinances unlock that connection with those who've gone before us. I love what Russell M. Nelson taught in the October 2022 Leahona. So he he quoted the story of Adam and Eve being baptized Mm -hmm. in the Pearl Great Price. Then President Nelson taught this. Adam and Eve accepted the ordinance of baptism and began the process of being one with God. They had entered the covenant path. When you and I also enter that path, we have a new way of life. We thereby create a relationship with God that allows Him to bless and change us. The covenant path leads us back to Him. If we let God prevail in our lives, that covenant will lead us closer and closer to Him. All covenants are intended to be binding. They create a relationship with everlasting ties. And like you said, I think that we see that so beautifully in Third Nephi here. Jesus is there. He's present. But he wants to lead us back to the Father and to be even closer to every member of the Godhead. So he's promising the Holy Ghost and giving them the ability to do that. And he's teaching them how to live in such a way that they can return to the presence of the Father um, and let that relationship be closer and closer through the covenants that they have made. I think that's beautifully expressed in chapter 19 when Jesus prays on behalf of these people. In verse 23, And now, Father, I pray unto thee for them and also for all those who shall believe on their words, that they may believe in me, that I may be in them, as thou, Father, art in me, that we may be one. And again in verse 29, 
Father, I pray not for the world, but for those whom thou hast given me out of the world because of their faith, that they may be purified in me, that I may be in them as thou, Father, art in me, that we may be one, that I may be glorified in them. And this image is so amazing of being one. That's why the new and everlasting covenant exists, so that we can have this close, intimate, binding, exalting relationship with Heavenly Father and the unity that we can achieve with Him through the covenant path. I I can't think of a better way to express it than being one with Him Mm -hmm. and with our family and the Savior all together there. And clearly the temple setting here is contributing to that because the temple is an essential part of the covenant path. It's all about relationships, right? Mm -hmm. Binding us in relationships. I love how in verse 25, don't you read that that experience where it says his face, (laughs) that they were as white as the countenance and also the garments of Jesus. And then he smiles upon them and that they are filled with whiteness. His countenance, his purity is becoming their purity. I recall when we had our youngest little one mm. from South Africa, when we had him sealed to us and he was in his little white suit and we took him in the sealing room and he looked all around and he pointed his fingers up and he said, light, mm. light. <laughs> and he was just looking around and he was sensing that. And then he became very quiet mm. during the sealing and was just looking into everyone's eyes. And I just thought, I don't know if I could ever experience anything any better than that. Yes. Any better than that moment. He's feeling the love and light that is God, Mm -hmm. being at one with that and bound to his family forever. Mm -hmm. Josh, what's your overall take as you look at these chapters, 17 through 19, what's the overall takeaway that you get from Christ's preaching among his people? I love the ministry of Jesus here because it reminds me that as I try to stay on the covenant path as imperfect as I am, that Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ always fulfill their promises. In 3 Nephi 11, when he first shows up, it's, you know, the, these are, this is after all the destruction of the, the wicked and everything. So what's left is these righteous people that have looked forward to him through trial and tribulation and mockery and all these issues. And he shows up in 3 Nephi 11. And the first thing he says to them In chapter 11, verse 10, Behold, I am Jesus Christ, whom the prophets testified shall come into the world. And these are people who put their faith in the words of the prophets and their faith in the Savior and His coming. And I see Him here just vindicating everything that they've been through and every hope that they've had through thick and thin, through all the hard times and the bad. He's saying, your faith was not in vain. I'm here. Everything you look forward to, I'm here. It reminds me that no matter the hard things we go through here, that we're gonna have a Nephite-like experience someday with the Savior where each of us will get to feel the prints of the nails and in his hands and his feet and and bathe his feet with our tears. And I think in that moment, everything we have suffered and everything we've been through is gonna be more than worth it. And we get to look forward to this intimate moment with the Savior at the end of it all. That's a beautiful testimony, Josh. Thanks so much for sharing that with us. Mm You know, Sheila, it's been such a pleasure to get to know you today and to hear from your experiences. Would you mind telling us with all that you've experienced, what keeps you on the covenant path? My love for the Savior, uh, being able to feel of His presence in my life, the blessing it is to be a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and His importance in my life. He elevates us, doesn't He? He helps us. He reaches out and brings us up when we are in tough times. And it's so miraculous that you don't ever want to let it go. You don't ever want to be found not worthy to be in His presence, in the temple, in your homes, with your families. Um, He's there. He lives. Well, that is such a beautiful testimony. Thank you so much for being here with us today. It's been so wonderful getting to know you and learning from you. And Josh, thanks for joining us for this portion and for really expanding our knowledge of these chapters. And Janet, as always, it's such a pleasure. You've been wonderful walking us through this block in Mm -hmm. such a beautiful way. And for those watching at home, thank you for joining us for this discussion from 35 chapters 17 through 19. Visit byutv.org slash come follow up for more study and teaching resources. And join us next week as we study 35 chapters 20 through 26 and discuss God's mercy and the importance of searching the scriptures. Thank you for watching. Mm -hmm.